Father God, thank you for this opportunity to come and to hear your word preached. Please bless, Pastor. Please bless the message. Please open our ears and our hearts and help us keep distractions to a minimum. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 All right, well, you're there in Ephesians chapter 5. I'd like you to keep your place there, but let me make a little bit of uh, an introduction before I get into the sermon this morning. This morning, I'm going to preach on a subject, and I'm preach a sermon that may uh, go down in the history of my ministry as the most unpopular sermon I've ever preached, uh, and that's okay. Uh, I'm not trying to win a popularity concert, a contest or you know, become the president or anything like that. But uh, this morning, I, I want to I preach on a very specific uh, subject, and I want to preach on the dangers of Facebook and social media. I want to talk about the dangers of Facebook and social media. And let me just begin by being very clear that uh, I, don't, I don't think being on Facebook or on social media is a, is a sin. I don't think it's, it's sinful to be on these types of sites. And I do believe that they have some sort of legitimate use. You know, uh, our, my wife and I have personally decided not to be on social media. Us personally, our church is on Facebook, our church is on, on YouTube and things of that nature. And I think that's uh, appropriate. I think that's, that's fine. But with that said, I do want to say this, that there are some big dangers when it comes to these social media type sites. And I want to talk about that. And I think this is a very relevant type uh, sermon because, uh, you know, we're told that 1.71 billion people are on Facebook today. There's only 7.125 billion people in the world, and 1.7 of them are on Facebook. 2.34 billion total on social media. 58% of adults use Facebook. 81% of adults who use the internet also use Facebook. So there's a lot of people on these media sites. In fact, in this room, there's many of you that have Facebook and Twitter, and I don't even know what all those things are, but um, you know, you're, you're on all of those things, and I want to just help you to make sure you don't cross into some dangerous test, uh, territory when it comes to these sites. Now, maybe you're here this morning, you'd say, well, I'm not on social media at all. This, this sermon's not for me. The principles we're going to talk about uh, this, this morning apply to uh, many areas of life. You know, you may be able to apply them to hobbies or uh, to sports or to television or to other things of that nature. But I want to give you uh, this morning just seven Warning, seven dangers when it comes to Facebook and other social medias. And maybe you say, well, I'm not on Facebook, but your children might be, or your grandchildren might be, and, or your employees might be, and it might be good for you to be aware of some of these things. If you're able to take notes this morning, I'd like you to write these down if you don't have a child on your lap or something like that. Number one this morning, I want to warn you about the danger of wasting your time. The danger of wasting your time on Facebook and other social type media. You're there in Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse number 15. Notice what the Bible says. Ephesians 5.15 says this. See then that ye walk circumspectly. You see that word circumspectly? Circumspect means to be watchful, to be discreet, to be cautious, or to walk with wisdom. The Bible says, see then that ye walk circumspectly. Notice, he says, not as fools. He said, don't walk like a fool. He said, I want you to walk like someone who has some discretion about them, some caution about them, some wisdom about them. Notice what he says, not as fools, but as wise. Now, here's what's interesting. The Bible equates wasting time to being a foolish person or to being a fool. Because the Bible says here in verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And then verse 16 is in the context of verse 15. He says, redeeming the time. Because the days are evil. The word redeem means to buy back. It means to recover. It means to see the value in. The Bible is telling us here that foolish people do not see the value of their time. And he says, if you're wise, if you walk circumspectly, you will redeem the time. Why? Because the days are evil. Uh, you're there in Ephesians. Go with me to the book of Colossians. You're going to go past Philippians into the book of Colossians. Let me show you from a, a, a different passage, the same idea. Colossians chapter number 4 and verse 5. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Now do me a favor, when you get to Colossians, keep your place there, put a bulletin or a bookmark or a ribbon or something there in Colossians because we're going to leave it and we're going to come back to it, all right? Colossians chapter 4 and look at verse 5. Notice what the Bible says. Walk in wisdom. I want you to notice the theme. It says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without 
redeeming the time. So again, he says, if you're going to walk in wisdom, if you're going to walk circumspectly, if you're going to not be a fool, you will learn to redeem the time. You will learn to value your time. You will learn that there is value in time. Today we are told that the average user spends 51 minutes a day on Facebook. And that number has been dr drastically increasing since Facebook has added more games and options to their platform. The average person has five different social media accounts. The average person spends 100 minutes a day on social media. There are people sitting in this room, and if it's you, I'm not mad at you, I'm just trying to help you. There's people sitting in this room that spend 100 minutes a day on social media. Here's a question I have for you. You spend 100 minutes a day reading your Bible? Amen. Spend 100 minutes a day in prayer? The average person spends 4.7 hours daily on their phones. And here's what you need to understand about time is that once time is wasted, it can never be recovered. Once time is wasted, it can never be retrieved. We, we, you don't have to turn there. I'll read this verse for you. We saw this on Wednesday night as we're studying the book of 2 Samuel. I, I, it's, I think it's becoming one of my favorite verses in, in the Bible. We saw a, the wise woman of Tekoa speaking to King David, and she says in 2 Samuel 14, 14, she says, for we must needs die and are. She says, she says, we're going to die, and she says, we are. She says, our lives are. She says, our time is. It on this earth is as water spilt on the ground which cannot be gathered up again. She says, your, your time on this earth is like if you were to take water and spill it and, and you try to retrieve that water and put it back into the cup that you poured it out of. He said, you can't, once water is spilt, it's gone. You, it's, you're not, you don't have the ability to retrieve it. And, and she's saying, our time on this earth and our lives as we draw closer to death, our time is, is our, when we waste it, it's like water that is spilt and it can be retrieved. It cannot be recollected. It can't be brought back. And one of the biggest problems with websites like Facebook and YouTube and social media is that people end up wasting a bunch of time, valuable time, that cannot be retrieved. Let me read for you uh, an excerpt here from a time management book written for entrepreneurs. I thought it was interesting. The writer says, now a special word about social media. Stay out of it altogether or impose strict disciplines on yourself. It is amazing how much time disappears into YouTube. I'll tell you something you probably won't want to believe. Now, I'm going to skip a little bit about, about this because he, he goes on to explain how he personally loves a lot of very successful business people. And, and he, he talks a little bit about that. But he says this, the more successful the business people are, he says, the less they personally have anything to do with any of this. He's talking about social media. They may have somebody creating the illusion of their participation if they feel that it aids their business sales or their fame somehow, but they aren't looking at it or engaged in it at all. This stuff is mindless entertainment for the masses, a means of feeling important for the chronically unimportant, distractions for an unsatisfactory real life. It is potentially addictive as crack cocaine. It is damaging to your ability to concentrate. It is incredibly childish. The busy, success-oriented entrepreneur should have no time available for the digital water cooler conversation. Now, I didn't write that, but I thought that was pretty good. And you know what? A lot of time is wasted that could be invested back into your personal growth, spiritual growth, family, business, ministry, whatever. It's wasted. Minutes and hours are wasted every week on this idea of Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and this and that. So I want to warn you this morning. It's fine if you're on these social sites. I'm not mad at you if you're on these social sites. Our, our church, like I said, has a Facebook uh, uh, page. This sermon will probably be posted on our church's Facebook page. I probably won't get a lot of likes, but, you know, it'll be uh, posted on there. I'm not saying it's wrong to be on these sites. I'm not saying it's a sin to be on these sites. But there are some dangers, and we've been told that most people, especially the younger they are, the more time they waste on these types of, of sites. And here's what God says about people that waste their time. He says they're fools. He said you're a fool. He said you're not wise. He said you're not walking circumspectly if you waste your time. You're there in, 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 uh, in, in Colossians. Go with me to 2 Corinthians. If you go backwards, you're going to go past, uh, of course, Philippians, Ephesians, Galatians, into the book of 2 Corinthians. Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians, Galatians, 2 Corinthians. Going backwards. 
Let me give you the second danger this morning. We said number one, there's a danger of wasting your time. But number two, there's the danger of comparing yourselves to others. There's a danger of playing the comparison game. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 says this, For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, notice the theme, are not wise. He says, you're not wise if you waste your time. But he says, you're not wise if you are comparing yourselves, measuring yourselves by themselves, comparing yourselves among themselves. And I, I recently preached an entire sermon on the subject of comparing yourself. So I'm not going to spend the, a lot of time on this point. But I just want to say this. One of the dangers of Facebook is that the entire platform is designed for and it lends itself for people to sit there and compare their lives, their marriage, their finances, their children, their property, their, their things, anything you want, with other people. You want to steer very clear of, of falling. And if you're one of these people that goes on there, you're constantly comparing, and saying, well, you know, I wish that I had a house like that, or I wish I had a car like that, or I wish I had a husband like that, or I wish I had a wife like that. And, and, and you're falling into this trap of allowing Facebook to be a place where you're constantly comparing yourself to others, then you, you might want to just take a break or completely get off of Facebook because there's a danger there of comparing yourselves to others. There's another danger. We can find it there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 also. We said, number one, there's a danger of wasting your time. And we said, number two, there's a danger of comparing yourselves to others. But here's number three. There's a danger of becoming self-exalting. There's a danger of becoming self-exalting. One of the big dangers with things like Facebook is that they lend themselves to becoming a boastful person or a bragging person or someone that commends himself. Are you there in 2 Corinthians 10, 12? Look at what it says. But we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that, notice this word, commend themselves. You that word commend? The word commend means to praise. Here Paul says there are some people that commend themselves. They praise themselves but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Look at verse 13. But we will not boast of things without our measure. He says some people compare themselves. Some people commend themselves. He says, but we will not boast of things without our measure. Go to Matthew chapter number 6. Should be fairly easy to find. First book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6. While you turn there, let me pre read for you out of Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27 and verse 2 says this, Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth. A stranger, and not thine own lips. Let me read that again. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth. A stranger and not thine own lips. We are raising a generation of young people that are being raised on these social media sites and they're being taught, they're being trained, they're being conditioned to become people who boast and brag and commend and praise themselves. The Bible says, let another man praise thee. And look, when I was growing up, you know, we were taught these things and maybe we're failing as parents. You know, maybe my generation of, of young parents is just failing to teach the next generation these things. But do you understand that it is uncouth? It is unbecoming. It is, it is not a, a, a good character or quality of life to become someone who is constantly boasting and bragging and commending and lifting up yourself. Matthew chapter 6 teaches us that it is possible to become a boaster or a bragger even in the area of spiritual things. And this is probably the, th the thing I'm most afraid of when it comes to our movement and Facebook is that we're turning spiritual things something to compare about. We're turning spiritual things something to boast about, something to commend about, something to brag about. And it's not new. It's just we can do it on the internet now. It's been happening for years and years and years and years and years. In fact, it's been happening since Christ. Jesus Christ taught on it. Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 1. Notice what he says. Take heed that you do not your alms before men. Now notice what he says. You've got to underline this in your Bible. To be seen of them. Do you see that? The problem is not when you do something before men. We all do things before men. I'm preaching right now before men and women and children. 
The problem is not when you go soul winning and people see you soul winning. The problem is not when you preach a sermon and people see you preach a sermon. The problem is not when you get up here and leave the music or read the text or, or take the offering or whatever it is that you do in service and ministry to God and people see you doing it. The problem is when you do it, when the motive behind the action is simply to be seen of men. Where you wouldn't do it if people didn't see you do it. He says, take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Luke verse 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee. Here, here's the, 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 what the, the, the modern equivalent would be. When thou doest thine alms, you don't have to make a Facebook post about it. You don't have to let the whole world know about it. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. That they may have men glory on them or be impressed with them or boast and brag on them. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. But when thou doest alms, notice what he says. Can we get back to this in Christianity? Let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Is there anything spiritual you do that nobody knows about, only God? Between you and God. Your left hand doesn't even know what your right hand is doing. That's what Jesus taught. He said, if you do things to be seen of men, if you do things to have the glory of men, you have your reward. Look at verse 3. But when thou doest thine alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which seeth in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Let me just be real honest with you this, the, the, this morning. I worry for our church and I worry for those that are in our movement. When I see or hear things and, and pe pe people are going on Facebook and social media sites and they're talking about how many times they've read the Bible, how many verses they have memorized, how much time they spend in prayer, how many people they got saved. And I think to myself, you know, do you do any of those things just, just so God knows about it? I mean, we don't always have to let the world know when we got someone saved or when we spent an hour in prayer or when we memorized the verse. But today, we're developing a, 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 a type of Christianity that everything you do, everything you do, must be put out there for the world to see. And here's the question I have. Do you ever do anything to not be seen of men? Is there ever anything spiritual you do that your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing? Go to Ma you're there in Matthew chapter 6. Go to Matthew 23. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 23. I talk to men, men who want to go in the ministry. Men come to me and say, I want to be a pastor. I'd like to be trained to be a pastor. I talk to those men about how many times they read their Bibles. You know why? Because I have a minimum qualification that I need from them before I will send them out. But you have never heard Pastor Jimenez get up here and boast and brag about how many times I've read the Bible cover to cover. You've never, had, you've never heard me get up here and say, let me tell you, you know, just how much time I spend in prayer. You know, I spend time in prayer. That's between me and God. And that'll be between you and God. And we're developing this idea where we're real verbal about the things that we do. And it scares me, to be honest with you. It scares me to death that we're developing. I don't want my children to grow up in a culture, an environment, where the only time they ever do anything for God, if there's a possibility that they might be able to let somebody know about it, or post it somewhere, or blog it somewhere, or put it somewhere. I don't, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things. I think blogs are fine. I think Facebook's fine. But you really ought to develop your motives as to why you do the things that you do. You're there in Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter 23, verse number 5. Notice what Jesus said. Matthew 23 and verse number 5. Matthew 23 and verse 5, the Bible says this, But all, this is what Jesus said, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. So there's nothing they do that's not without it being posted somewhere, publicized somewhere, being told of somewhere. They make broad their phylacteries. They enlarge the borders of their garments. There's a very real danger in this Facebook, social media culture where we all become a bunch of boasters and braggers and we always talk about the spiritual things they do. And let me go ahead and talk about this. And, and you know what? I, I, this has been something that's been on my heart for like months. And I, I decided that I wasn't going to talk about it. I wasn't going to deal with it 
until recently because I found out that it started in other, it's starting in other churches. And you say, well, what does that have to do with our church? Here's a problem that I have with that, is that unfortunately this happened, this started in our church. And I want to just come on the record and be extremely clear that this does not come from me. I was not for it. I've never been for it. I've always thought it was a stupid idea. And I just, and if other pastors have to deal with it in their churches, I'm just publicly apologizing to them that it started here. But, you know, I found out that the new fad in our movement is starting these little accountability groups where we sit around and talk about how much, you know, Bible I memorized or how much Bible reading I did and we talk about it. Let me explain to you something about accountability groups, all right? Accountability groups are meant for things that you're embarrassed about. You go to Weight Watchers and you, tell, you weigh in because you're embarrassed about that. Accountability is meant for, I'm struggling with drugs and I need somebody to help me stay accountable. I'm struggling with alcohol and I need somebody to help me stay accountable. I'm struggling with pornography and I need somebody to help me stay accountable. Okay, when a bunch of rich people get together and say, let's have accountability about how much money we made this week. You know what that, that's not accountability. It's called boasting and bragging. And when a bunch of Christians get together and want to boast and brag about, let's talk about how much Bible I read, how many verses I memorized, let's post it all over Facebook. That's called boasting and bragging. And I'm sad that it happened and it started here. And, you know, I'm, I'm publicly apologizing to these other churches if it's starting in their church because it's not a good Christian thing. It's not right. It's unbecoming. We ought not do things to be seen of men. There's a danger in becoming a self-exalting, self-promoting, self-boasting, self-bragging individual. Let me give the fourth point. You're there in uh, 2 Corinthians. If you kept your place in 2 Corinthians, the very next book is Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. I said, number one, there's a danger of wasting your time. I said, number two, there's a danger of comparing yourself. To, and by the way, the people that started that garbage in our church, they're gone. Praise the Lord for it. But I'm not, I, I, I'm not endorsing it. It wasn't my idea, and I've never liked it. And we've never been a part of it. I've never promoted it from the bulletin. I've, I've never had anybody in our family be a part of it. Number one, the danger of wasting your time. Number two, the danger of comparing yourselves to others. Number three, the danger of becoming self-exalting. Number four, the danger of criticizing others. You're there in Galatians 5. Look at verse number 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians. Galatians 5 and verse 15. Notice what the Bible says. Galatians 5, 15. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. One of the dangers of Facebook is that it lends itself to becoming a platform where people can indirectly criti criticize other people. And look, criticizing... And bad-mouthing other people, according to Paul, is not spiritual, it's carnal. He says, if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And here's the problem with criticizing people, is that it makes you feel spiritual to tell other people apart. It makes you feel spiritual to say, well, I've got it all put together, and let me show you, and let me tell you. And Facebook provides this platform where people will criticize other church members, they'll criticize their church, they'll criticize their pastors, they'll criticize their spouse. I mean, people are literally criticizing their husband or their wife on Facebook. It's like, I, 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 don't, I mean, I'm not on Facebook, I don't know how Facebook works, but I would imagine that your wife would be able to see what you wrote. But that's the point, isn't it? I want to embarrass my husband on Facebook. I want to embarrass my wife on Facebook. I want to embarrass my, uh, you know, fellow church member on Facebook. And here's the problem that I have with it. Because people say, like, well, Pastor, you get up there and you preach all these things. But here's the difference. Everything I preach behind the pulpit, I would say to somebody to their face. Amen. And so, uh, when I preach on divorce, if somebody went in that office and said, Pastor, let me ask you a question. I'm thinking of divorcing my wife. I would tell them, no, it's wrong. I would tell people no fornication is wrong. I would tell them no drunkenness is wrong. Everything I preach behind the pulpit, I would say kindly and tactfully and gently to somebody uh, 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 to their face. But here's what people do. They go on Facebook and they say things they never say to someone to their face. Maybe the next time you're on Facebook and you're going to put a post, you got to ask yourself, would I, I, I would say that, I know I'd say it on Facebook, but would I say it to their face? <laughs> the danger of criticizing others is not spiritual. If you bite and devour one another, the Bible, Paul says, walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Go to James chapter number four. You're there in Galatians. You're going to go past Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. James chapter four and look at verse number 11. James chapter four and verse number 11. 
while you go there, let me read for you out of Colossians 4, 6. Colossians 4, 6 says, says this, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with song, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. And by the way, let me explain something to you. You understand that preaching is different than dealing with people personally? God tells us to cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. God tells us to, you know, show the people their sin. But God tells us to point things out behind the pulpit under the setting of preaching. I don't talk to people at the door the way that I preach. Do you know that? Because people listen to my preaching online, they listen to pastors like, like myself online, and they think that this is how we treat people. We just knock on doors and we're just these big fat jerks of people. You got to be tactful. You got to be kind. You got to be graceful. The Bible says, let your speech be always with grace. Amen. Seasoned with salt that ye may know how you have to answer every man. James chapter 4, look at verse 11. Notice what the Bible says. James chapter 4 and verse 11. The Bible says this. Speak not evil one of another. That's a command. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Go to chapter 5 and verse 9. You're there in chapter 4, just one page over. Chapter 5 and verse 9. Grudge not against one another. Grudge not against one another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Here, do you notice the theme is this? You're not their judge. You're not God. Look, if, if, if it's your place of authority, then deal with it. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to go on Facebook and correct my wife. If my wife needs correcting, I'll just correct her. And praise the Lord, I have a wonderful wife that never needs correcting, you know. But, but if I do, I need to go to Facebook and do it. That's under my sphere of authority. I'm not going to go on Facebook and say, man, my children need to just clean their rooms. Hint, hint. I hope they see this post. You know, I'm going to go on Facebook. I'm really tired of these kids just not having, you know, not cleaning their rooms. Just hoping my kids see it, right? I'm really tired of children just not putting their dirty laundry in the laundry hamper. You know, I'm just hoping that my eight-year-old sees it. I'm hoping that my four-year-old sees it on Facebook and they get the hint. No, you know what? They're under my authority. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk up to my eight-year-old and say, pick up your clothes and put them in the dirty laundry. And the problem with Facebook is you're trying to correct people that are not under your sphere of authority. Because if they were under your sphere of authority, you'd just correct it. The problem with speaking evil and biting and devouring one another and grudging against another is that Facebook lends itself as a platform to sit there and criticize and badmouth and it makes us feel spiritual as we're doing it. People criticize their, their, their spouse on, on Facebook, their church on Facebook, their pastor on Facebook, their friends on Facebook. Let me say this, Fundamental Baptist Movement the fundamental Baptist has a big problem with this. The problem we have is we're so right, it feeds our pride. We're so right about everything. You know, and here's what I think is funny, because I get all these emails, and yeah, I'm picking on everyone who sent me an email, all right? <laughs> I get all these emails, and people are like, you're my pastor this, and my church this, and my blah, blah, blah. You know what's funny? I grew up in an independent fundamental Baptist church my whole life. Got along with my pastors. Was the best of church members. Never had a problem. In fact, had one of them send me out to start this church, knowing I wasn't pre-trib, knowing I didn't want Sunday school, knowing I didn't want a bus ministry, I had a good enough relationship with him that he sent me out to start this church, knowing I didn't agree with all those things. Pastor Anderson, we grew up in the same church for many years, and, and he went to other churches where he got along great with these pastors, got along great with, with these ministries, just did what he could and stayed quiet. You know, and, and then, but we got all these other people like, well, my pastor just hates me. Because I'm not pre-trib. You know, you know what I'm finding out? I think your pastor hates you because you're a jerk. That's why. We had, we had a family come to our church. They came to our church and they were like, our pastor hates us because we're not pre-trib. And I'm like, oh, that's terrible. Oh, that's horrible. I can't believe that. You know, they came to our church. They were literally the worst church members we've ever had. When they quit our church, my wife and I threw a party. We were just like, praise God that these people are gone. You know what I realized? I think your pastor hated you because you're a jerk. That was just the excuse he was telling you. He's just telling you, oh, we're, we're not pre-trib, so you might want to leave. You know, you're not pre-trib. It's like, no, you're a jerk. You're lazy. You badmouth people. That's the problem. You know, you, these people need to just go to their churches and just shut up. And just go soul winning. And just, I get emails, people are like, I just started going to a church last week. They're not pre-trib. How do I correct that? Uh, how about you don't? Amen. How about you leave it alone? 
I mean, there are some people, this war, just this morning, I had somebody ask me, saying, I, I was out of town, I visited this church, very nice church, you know, and they're asking me, I'd like to get them some resources, and I talked to them about how to do it respectfully and tactfully. I think there's a place for that. But these people that want to walk around and correct everyone and criticize everybody, and I'm going to tell them what's wrong with their nursery and their Sunday school and their thing. You've been there for two weeks. Why don't you just show up for a while? Amen. Why don't you just go soul winning for a while? Why don't you just shut your mouth and get in line and love your pastor and pray for his wife and love their children and maybe after you've been there five years, they'll have enough respect for you to hear what you have to say. Today, you know, and, and Facebook lends itself to be these platforms where these novice want to go and, and give all their expert advice. You know, I'm not trying to be rude, but please understand something. If you're broke, I don't want to hear your financial advice. Do you understand that? If you're fat, I don't want to hear your health advice. If you're single, I don't want your marriage advice. If you have no children, you got one child, I don't really need your lecture on parenting. If you just showed up to our church last week, I don't really care what you think we're doing wrong. Do you understand that? You have to earn the right to correct people. And you should do it tactfully Amen. and gracefully. And the danger of criticizing others is that Facebook provides this platform where everybody wants to become the expert. And all these Christians have been saved for three weeks, been soul winning one time. All of a sudden, they want to tell you how we're all doing it wrong. They haven't even read their Bible cover to cover once, but they want to explain to us because they listen to some sermon. Amen. It's ridiculous. There's a danger of criticizing others. I said, number one, there's a danger of wasting your time. Number two, there's a danger of comparing yourselves to others. Number three, there's a danger of becoming self-exalting. Number four, there's a danger of criticizing others. Number five, there's a danger of becoming a gossip. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. You find the T books, you got 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus. Look, I know this, ser this sermon is not going to go viral on, on YouTube, but I'm just going to have fun while I'm doing it. 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is, like, this is like therapy for me. 1 Timothy chapter 5, look at verse 13. 1 Timothy 5, 13 says this, And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. You don't have to turn there, but 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 15 says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. The Bible says that they are, there in 1 Timothy 5.13, they're tattlers and busybodies. Wandering about from house to house. But you know what? They don't have to wander about from house to house anymore. They just wander about from page to page. They just wander about from group to group, just getting involved and meddling. And in fact, well, did you hear about this person? And of course, you hear about it because everybody wants to gossip about their husband, gossip about their wife, gossip about their job, gossip about their pastor, gossip about their church, gossip about all the things they don't like. There's a danger of becoming a tattler and a busybody and a gossip. And look, I'm just here to tell you, it's not spiritual. It's not Christianity. It's not Christian-like to be a tattler. You know what a tattler is? Someone who repeats matters. You know what a busybody is? Someone who's busy meddling with other people's affairs. And I, you know, I think to myself, don't you have a job? I mean, don't you work? You got all these kids. You say you homeschool them. When? You're on Facebook all the time. You're on YouTube all the time. Go to Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. You're there in 1 Timothy, you're going to go past Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. We'll be done soon, don't worry. I know this sermon's uncomfortable for everybody, so. Number six. And people are like, Pastor's preaching that sermon because of me. Like, 80% of you are on Facebook, all right? Yeah, it's because of you. <laughs> you know, and here's what, I've noticed about, here's what I've noticed about hard preaching. Everybody loves hard preaching as long as it's about the other guy. You know, they, they, all, they all want to go on Facebook and say, that sermon was really great about blah, 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 hoping that so-and-so, you know, let me, let me forward you the link, brother. This is a great sermon. <laughs> but when it's about you, you know, it's like, oh, I'm a pastor. <laughs> you know, and let me say this. If you're mad at me for preaching this sermon, you ought, to, you ought to, you know, just look in your own heart and want, why are you mad? Oh. Why are you upset? I never said Facebook was a sin. I just said there's dangers. Maybe you're in dangerous territory. <laughs> Number six. The danger, there's a danger of staying connected with wrong people. There's a danger with Facebook of staying connected 
with wrong people. Let me explain something to you. You don't need to stay connected with every person you've ever met your whole entire life. Do you know that? You don't need to just stay connected with every kid I went to grade school with, every kid I went to middle high school with, every person I went to high school with, every person I went to college with, everyone I've ever met and everyone they've ever met. I'm going to stay connected with all these people. You know, there's a danger in that. You know, let, let me just give you some advice. I'm not on Facebook, but if I were on Facebook, I, wouldn't, I don't even know how Facebook works, but you know, I wouldn't be friends with people that, you know, people of the opposite gender. I don't need to, I, I don't want to be friends with people of the opposite gender in person. Why would I want to do it on Facebook? I, look, you don't need to be friends with your high school sweetheart if you're married. Do you understand that? You don't need to be friends with your old boyfriend and your old girlfriend and your old, uh, you know, uh, college sweetheart. Some estimate that 20% of divorces originate because of Facebook. 15% of individuals admit that they considered getting a divorce as a result of their spouse's online activity. 25% of people said that they had at least one argument per week as a result of social media with their spouse. 17% of people say they fight every day with their spouse as a result of social media. And who they talk to and what they talk about. Hebrews 11.15, notice what the Bible says. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. If you're constantly looking back at your old life, you might, you might go back there. You know what I've noticed? The people who cannot sell out for the things of God are the people that are just unwilling to cut ties with the old life. Amen. You don't have to be friends. You don't have to stay connected. You don't have to know what's going on with every kid you went to kindergarten with. I mean, it's just not needed in life. In fact, there are some relationships that you should break. There are some relationships that you should cut. There are some people that they're not bad people and you're not bad people. It's just you don't need to have a relationship with them in this place in your life. And if you had been mindful of that country from whence you came out, that's why you're going to have opportunity to have returned. Jesus said, unto, uh, said in Luke 9, 62, he's, the Bible says, And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Amen. You know what? Sometimes you need to just cut the ties. Sometimes you need to just unfriend. Sometimes you need to just delete. And log off. I said, number one, there's a danger of wasting your time. And I said, number two, there's a danger of comparing yourselves to others. And I said, number three, there's a danger of becoming self-exalting. I said, number four, there's a danger of criticizing others. I said, number five, there's a danger of becoming a gossip. I said, number six, there's a danger of staying connected with the wrong people. Number seven, there's a danger of a false sense of community with others. There's a danger of a false sense of community with others. Do you know that God created us for community? God wants us to be a community. And he gave an answer for that community. It's called the local New Testament church. Amen. We come together and we find our community and our friendships. And I believe that our social lives should revolve around the church, not social media. Amen. Amen. I believe that your friends ought to be actual real life friends that you can touch, you know, with, and, and, they, and if you cut them, they bleed, you know, like real people that you've actually met. Don't cut your friends. Okay. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Hebrews 10.25, notice what the Bible says. Hebrews 10.25. Hebrews 10.25, the Bible says this. Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know what's one of the dangers of Facebook? Is that people feel like they're connected spiritually when they don't go to church. It's not that they, they don't go to church anywhere. Their church is sitting in a dark living room watching YouTube videos and, and, and at the same time they're on Facebook talking about how great they like the sermon and they feel connected. They're like, that was a great time. I got, all these, I got 10 thousand friends. That's not what God meant. Amen. That's not what God wanted. God wanted you to actually get, you know, there's something good. You ever had like, you ever took like two or three days off? I haven't done this. You know, and it's since I started the church, but, you know, some of you have done this, where, you know, you take like two or three days off and you just like do nothing. You're just like in your pajamas for three days. <laughs> you know, actually, that can get pretty depressing. There's actually something good about getting up and taking a shower and putting some fresh clothes on and going out and, you know, seeing the sun <laughs> and having to like deal with people. There's a good aspect of that. It's called being healthy. 
And today you've got these people. They feel like they're connected. They've got all these friends. They got, you know, you, you know what, you know how you ought to feel connected at Verity Baptist Church? By showing up Sunday morning. That's how you should feel connected. Amen. By showing up Sunday night. By showing up Wednesday night. By going soul winning and developing friendships. By going to events. That's where your sense of community ought to come. But today you've got this virtual community. Where I don't have to do anything, be right with anything, be kind to anyone, love anyone, deal with relationship, deal with heart. I don't have to do anything. I can just, from the computer. God says, hey, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Your sense of community should come from actually going to church. Your sense of community should come from actually developing relationships. Your sense of community should, look, watching videos on YouTube is not church. But they were live streamed. I don't care. <laughs> if you can't see the whites of the preacher's eyes, you're not right with God, if that's what you're calling church. Now, if you go to church and then you, you know, throughout the week, you're, you know, your lady and you're folding laundry or you're, you know, washing the, 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 the cups and the dishes or whatever, you're listening to preaching, there's nothing wrong with that. Praise the Lord for it. Do it. But if you're just listening to preaching online and you call that church, or you're like, I'm not going to show up to Wednesday night service, but I'll catch it online. You're not right with God. And, and, if, and let me just say this. If you're not a soul winner, you're not right with God either. Amen. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Amen. And you know, I want people to feel connected because they're soul winners. I want people to, I, you know, you, I, the way you want to determine, you know how I find leaders at Verity Baptist Church, if I need people to lead certain ministries? Here's how I find leaders. Are they faithful to the services? Are they soul winners? And can they play well with others? Like, that sounds like kindergarten. Yeah, it's good principles in kindergarten. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't base it on how many views they have on YouTube or how many people have watched their videos or how many likes they have. That's not spirituality. And most of the spirituality you see on Facebook, it's fake. It's people commending and exalting themselves. They're not spiritual. They look real spiritual on Facebook. And, I, I, you know, I scratch my head and say, when are you going to show up to church? I haven't seen you in like six weeks. There's a danger of staying, uh, of developing a false sense of community. Say, Pastor, are you saying everyone on Facebook is not right with God? I never said that. Somebody will walk out of here saying, saying I said that. <laughs> Upset that I said that. <laughs> Telling other pastors I said that. I never said that. The church is on Facebook. This sermon will be on Facebook. Do me a favor, like it on Facebook. <laughs> Share it with your friends. <laughs> I don't think it's wrong for people to be on Facebook, but there are dangers to Facebook. There are dangers to social media. Make sure you're not wasting your time. Make sure you're not comparing yourselves with others. Make sure you're not exalting yourself. Make sure you're not criticizing others, gossiping about others, or learning gossip about others. Make sure you're not staying connected with people that you have no business staying connected with. And make sure that your sense of community comes from real life people. Not a false sense of a virtual community. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help this.